open up with me to the book of the Revelation. We're going to start a series going through the book of the Revelation, line by line, precept by precept, line by line, precept by precept, as it says in the book of Isaiah. In our time, and you know what, I, I don't know if there has ever been a time since I've been alive, 52 years, where there has been more of an interest in the future than there is right now. It's amazing if you turn on the Discover Station or natural, uh, National Geographic, how many shows there are dealing with prophecies, uh, the December 21st, 2012 Mayan prediction of the end of the world, uh, predictions from uh, astrologers and spiritists about what's going to happen in the world tomorrow, uh, predictions from Nostradamus and so many other things, and even shows on the Bible, the book of the Revelation. Let me just stress something to you. If you listen to the predictions that are being made, and, and it's amazing, I was in a boardroom of a Fortune 500 company with the president, the uh, vice president, the, um, a bunch of the, the key managers, and they're looking at me, and this is right after Hurricane Irene, and they're looking at me and they're asking me, do you think this is the end of the world? These, these, are, these are not you know, Christian people. Just do, do you think this is the end of the world? And I want to stress something to you, what the Word of God says. The world ain't going to the devil. And that's a, just understand that. The world ain't going, some Christians even portray the world going to the devil. The world ain't going to the devil. And mankind is not going to create a utopia where they solve all of the problems. The world is going to God. But the journey that gets us there, I'll tell you, it's a rough one. And, and I believe the times of the end, the end times, the last days that were spoken of by Jesus, by Daniel, by Paul, by Isaiah, Jeremiah, I, I believe that we are in that time right now. You have people coming to you, and I'm sure they're asking you, you know, with all these I mean, hurricanes and storms and volcanoes and uh, the world in chaos and wars and rumors of I mean, all these things that are going on, there is this awareness that we are in a time that is unlike any other time that we had ever been in. Now, how do we know? How can we know of what tomorrow holds? And God has given us a, a book called the book of the Revelation. I'll just say this. If you take the book of the Revelation out of the Bible, you, you are, you are going to be left with a, a lot of unanswered questions. But the book of the Revelation gives us a, a, a ton of answers to our questions. I, I want you to look verse 1. And I'm just going to start with you with the first three verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. I want you to, to focus in with me first at the, the name Revelation. The name Revelation, essentially it means apocalypse, or it is an, an unveiling. It, it is God's unveiling of, of future, futuristic things. The, the scripture goes on here to say that God, he passed this revelation to Jesus, who passed it to an angel, who then is passing it to John, who is then to pass it to the servants of the Lord, to us. And it tells us that the Lord showed John, and I want you to notice, I put in your notes, you know, and I, I want to put emphasis on this, the word show and the word saw. Because here is a man in the first century, this is a first century man, he has been exiled to the island of Patmos. He's in a penal colony for preaching the word of God. And this first century man is taken by the Lord and shown these, these glorious things. In chapter 4 verse 1, he is taken to heaven. And he is given a glimpse of, of the, the heavenly vision. In, in Revelation chapter 17, he's taken to the wilderness. In Revelation chapter 20, he, uh, 21, he's taken up into a mountain. But he's seeing futuristic things. And I want you to think of this. Put yourself in a mindset of being a first century person. You're a first century person... 
and you see a nuclear explosion, how would you describe it? And John, I believe, what is being described either as a nuclear explosion or some type of massive volcanic eruption, he is describing it as the sky receding like a scroll. In Revelation chapter 9, he describes this army of locusts that he sees. And he says they have breastplates of iron and they have tails that sting. And they have crowns upon their heads. And they have the face of a man. When I first read that over 28 years ago, on a beach down in, in Long Beach Island, sitting with my bride, God had started to really reveal his word to me. I'm reading that and I'm saying, you know what that sounds like? It, it sounds like a helicopter, an Apache helicopter. So, so the descriptions that I believe John is giving, again, it's a first century mind trying to describe things that, that are going on hundreds, thousands of years later. Uh, another key thing to look at in this first three verses is the word shortly. If you look at the word shortly and people say, well, the Lord said to John it's going to shortly happen, which means, even though that was the first century, this is, this is being given to John somewhere around probably 91, 96 A.D., so you think maybe it was going to happen, hey, within the next few years. But the word shortly, the word is uh, takmos. I would say it's takmos. And what, what takmos, it's the word that we get, um, we, we get the word uh, tachometer from it. You have a tachometer in your car. If you know about a tachometer, what happens, when, when, when the pressure begins to build in the engine, it accelerates, it moves really fast. And, and I believe what, what the Word of God is saying here is not that, hey, John, it's going to happen in the next, the next few days or the next few years. What it's saying is, when this begins to happen, it's going to unravel and happen really quickly. And as you begin to get into the book, something that you see, John chapter 1, he receives the vision. John chapters 2 and 3, it talks about the church age. In John chapter 4 and 5, there's a revelation of heaven. In John chapter 6 through 19, and it's interesting, the church age takes, I mean, we're in the church age now for a few thousand years. This is the age of grace. Let me tell you, jump on board with Jesus. Salvation is free. You just have to believe in Him to be saved. We're in the age of grace. At the end of the age of grace, the Lord is coming to take His church out of this world. And He is once again, again going to deal with Israel. That's why Israel, if you look, in 1948 became a nation. For the first time in 1870 years, Israel became a nation. I believe the greatest miracle, people ask me, what is the greatest miracle of our time? The rebirth of Israel. And the Jewish people, as the prophecy said, began to return from the north, south, east, and west, from uh, the Soviet Union, from Russia. They began to return from the south. They began to return from Ethiopia, as the scriptures uh, you know, testify to. And then the Hebrew language was restored to the Jewish people. There is no case in all of history, linguistically, where a language that had been lost for hundreds, thousands of years is returned to the people. They win Jerusalem as their capital city in 1968. I believe we are in that period right now. We're getting very close when God is going to deal with Israel because Israel still has rejected their Messiah. And we're going to enter into a period called Jacob's Trouble. It's interesting that Jacob's Trouble, I believe, is what you find in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. Revelation 6 through 19, and think of this, the church age takes thousands of years, but Revelation 6 through 19, it's a seven-year period, which then brings the, the second coming of the Lord to earth with his heavenly armies. He defeats the Antichrist. He locks up the devil. And then you have what is called the millennial period, which is 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth. And then from that comes the final judgment and eternity. And, and by the way, it's presented very systematically as you go through the book. What's interesting though, the tribulation period, the seven year period, Jacob's trouble, that period is a seven-year period, and most of the book of the Revelation is devoted to that seven-year period, chapter 6 through 19. The church age lasts for thousands of years, and suddenly there's this, this rapid speed-up that happens. The tachometer takes off, and what the Lord described as shortly happens very quickly. You'll notice also in verse 3 that there is a blessing. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. And notice, it's not just for those 
who hear and read. Notice, and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. It's not just enough to hear it or, or to read it. You have to be applying your life to it and doing it. That's the difference between being a, a, a true Christian and being a false Christian. It's the difference between being somebody who is of the wheat or somebody who is of the tares or the weeds. Being alive to Christ or being dead to Christ. Being alive to Christ or being lukewarm to Christ. I put in your notes that there are seven blessings in the book of the Revelation. I just want to, I want to show you something uh, uh, neat here. I, I believe that of those seven blessings that we as believers are going to partake in six of them. If you'll notice, I believe there's one that I'm not going to be partaking in. And that, that is the second. If you look at the second, it, it occurs in Revelation 14, 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works will follow them. Who that's talking about is, it's talking about believers in the tribulation period who will be martyred by the Antichrist. And as we go through in upcoming weeks, we'll look at that very closely. Folks, I'm not going to be there. I hope you're not going to be there. Because when you begin to understand the tribulation period, I'll tell you, I, I don't think it's going to be worse than hell. But I, I'll say this, I, I believe it's something you don't want to be going through. And I, I'm not going to be there. I, I'm going to be at, and look at, look at verse uh, 9 of chapter 19. This is somewhere where I'm going to be. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. I'm going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I'll tell you, I don't care if, if, if the Lord says, hey, you know what, you got the last seat with, you know, the big speaker in front of you. You know when you go to the wedding and there's the big speaker in front of you and your ears are ringing for the next three days? I know some of you young people, you may like that. The older we get, the less we like it. I don't care if the Lord puts me at the last, I mean, it could be the last table all the way in the back, but I'm going to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb. I've got the invitation. Have you received your invitation? I got my invitation when I took Jesus Christ into my heart. I'm going to be there to celebrate. You know, the truth of the matter is, I'm part of the bride. Could you imagine that? Me in white? <laughs> Here comes the bride. Somehow he's going to make me look good. Yeah, I don't know how he's going to do it. He's going to make me look good. And Jesus is going to be standing at the altar looking at his bride. We are the bride of Christ. And, and who are going to be all the guests? The Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints. Abraham and, and Moses and, and Isaac and David. They're the guests, but the church is the bride. And I'm going to be there. And we're going to be there. All of us who have faith in him as our Lord and Savior. I want you to, to just take notice here for a moment. Seven blessings. And as you start to go through the book of the Revelation, you see seven blesses, seven churches, seven lampstands, seven stars, seven spirits, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. The heptatic structure of Scripture. The number seven is the number of God. It's the number of perfection. It's the number of completeness. And you see it occur throughout the Scriptures. Revelation is no different than any of the other books in the Bible. I, I want to just stress something to you. The heptatic structure, and when I taught, I taught this about a year ago, there are numerous evidences to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. The, 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 the skeptics who criticize the Bible and mock the Bible, the Bill Mars who, who have the ears of, he has the ears of millions of young people today. It's really tragic. When he sits in these shows and sarcastically mocks the Bible, he's an idiot and he knows nothing. I just say he knows nothing. He has never taken the time to look at the Word of God. He will mock the flood of Noah. He will mock the parting of the Red Sea. But he has never taken the time to look at Scripture. Anybody who would mock so, so brainlessly is a fool. There are numerous evidences to believe that the Word of God, okay, the Bible, is truly God's Word. Just say, I've always stood upon, of course, prophecy. The, the prophecies of the scriptures are, are just, they, they give overwhelming evidence that the author of this book, he knew the future and he revealed it to his prophets as they wrote down the word. And in the scriptures, 
there are 1,817 verses devoted, I'm sorry, 1,817 1, prophecies in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are 1,239. In the New Testament, there are 578. If you, if you take that, there are 31,124 verses in the entire Bible. 8,352 are devoted to prophecy. That's 27% of the Bible. That's one quarter of the entire New and Old Testament. The, the, it gives strong, strong evidence. And when you look at these prophecies that were made, and then you look at the future, sometimes 100, 200, 300, thousands of years in the future, of course, with hindsight, we see these things being fulfilled. And the only way that could have been done is if, again, someone who knew the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning, somebody who knew the future, was revealing these things uh, to God, uh, to, to the servants, and it was God. Now, I, I want to just share with you another, another thing. And some of you have, have sat with me on Bible studies where we have looked at this, the heptatic structure. Because the heptatic structure of Scripture... Yeah, I, you know, they say that the ultimate evidence for anything is mathematics. And you have mathematical evidence that the Bible is the Word of God in the heptatic structure of Scripture. And the number seven appearing over and over again. I want to just show you one passage of Scripture. I'm going to share with this with you. You're not going to be able to write this down. Um, I, I'll, I'll give it to you. You can look it up. A man named Ivan Panin, who was a Russian historian, spent about 50 years studying the Word of God and began to identify what are called this heptatic structure throughout the Scriptures, the number seven repeating over and over and over and over again. He, he found it in, in all the books. He found it in the Old Testament and New Testament. I want to give you one example. It's a passage that I've studied. It is Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, the genealogy of Jesus. I'm sure for many of you it's your favorite passage in the Bible, right? You know, Adam begot this one, and that one begot that one, right? I, I know you all love it, and you love to go there and study it. But let me just show you the heptatic structure in, in that passage. The number of words, and I want you to, to grasp onto this, there, is, there are numbers that continuously appear in the heptatic structure of Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, over and over again, that are divisible by the number 7. The number of words which are nouns is exactly 56, divisible by 7. The Greek word, the, occurs more frequently in the passage, exactly 56 times, which is divisible by 7. Also, the number of different forms in which the article, the, occurs is exactly 7. There are two main sections in the passage, verses 1 through 11 and 12 through 17, in the same main section, the number of Greek vocabulary words is 49, exactly divisible by 7, 7 times 7. Of these 49 words, the number of those beginning with a vowel is 28, divisible by 7. The number of words beginning with a consonant is 21, divisible by 7. The number of vowels among the 266 letters is 140, divisible by 7. The, uh, of the 49 words, the number of words which occur more than once is 35, divisible by 7. The number of words which occur in only one form is exactly 42, divisible by 7. The number of 69 Greek vocabulary words which are nouns is, divisible, uh, is number 42, divisible by 7. Seven. Of the nouns, 35 uh, are proper names, which are divisible by 7. These 35 nouns are used once 63 times, which is divisible by 7. The number of male names is 28 divisible by 7. These male names occur 56 times, which is divisible by 7. The number which are not male names is 7, which is obviously divisible by 7. Three women are mentioned, Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. The number of Greek letters in these three names is 14, which is divisible by 7. The number of compound nouns is 7. The number of Greek letters in these seven nouns is 49, which is divisible by seven. Only one city is named in the passage Babylon, which, is Greek, which in Greek contains exactly seven letters, again, divisible by seven. Just to understand this and the properties, um, if someone was to attempt to design a genealogy, okay, you make it up yourselves. Let's say you get the whole church together and we're going to make this up. And we're going to create our own genealogy. This is the, uh, these are, these are the, the conditions and this, again, is what is met in Matthew chapter one. The number of words must be divis divisible by seven evenly. The number of letters must also be divisible by seven. The number of vowels the, and, and the numbers of consonants must be divisible by seven. The number of words that begin with a vowel must be divisible by seven. The number of words which begin with a consonant must be divisible by seven. The number of words which that occur more than once must be divisible by seven. The number of words that occur in more than one form must be divisible by seven. The number of words that occur in only one form shall be divisible by seven. The number of nouns shall be divisible by, by seven. Only seven words shall not be nouns. The number of names in the 
genealogy shall be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns are permitted. The number of male names shall be divisible by seven. The number of generations shall be, uh, uh, shall be 21, also divisible by seven. Did you get that? Uh, did you all get that? Okay. You copy that down. I, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. By the way, Ivan Panin's book is... Uh, the inspiration of scripture scientifically demonstrated. And that's, by the way, is one passage, and he does this over and over again. Let me just tell you, Statistic Magazine was given this, okay? If you read Statistic Magazine, which is a very skeptical magazine, but Statistical Magazine was given this, the response in the article after their scholars had gone through this passage was, they called it an anomaly, and they could not explain it. They, they said that if you were to take... 400 supercomputers that it would take thousands and thousands of years to be able to concoct this. Now, either Matthew had supercomputers, or Matthew got together maybe, maybe 4,000 of the greatest scribes in the world, and they sat down and spent 2,000 years trying to put this together. Or this book is divinely inspired, and you have in the heptatic structure of just Matthew chapter 1, not to mention numerous other passages... Evidence, mathematical evidence. Look, one plus one equals two. I know in our crazy world there are psychos out there who say one plus one doesn't equal two. But one plus one equals two. As far as I know, it still does. And when you look at that kind of evidence from Scripture, it is overwhelming that the Bible is inspired and the very Word of God. Most people do not take the time to look at things like this. Most people do not take the time to, to look at the prophecies and see, and see them fulfilled, again, with hindsight. Second thing I want you to look at with me here. So we see the introduction given. And then we have the, the welcome. And the welcome and the recipients of the seven churches... Here is John welcoming and speaking to the seven churches. I want to just touch on this briefly. The seven churches were seven literal churches which are in Asia Minor. I put a map on the back of your uh, study guide. It gives you a picture of where those seven churches were. It's modern day Turkey. The seven churches though also speak of, and if anybody has studied church history, there is an uncanny resemblance between the seven churches and seven church periods that we have gone through, beginning with Ephesus and finishing with Laodicea. And I do believe we are in the Laodicean period, which is a scary thing. It also speaks of seven kinds of churches. Living Word is one of these types of churches. And it also speaks of types of Christians. As you go through the seven churches, you will find that, hey, you and your walk with Christ fits into one of those seven churches. We will begin next week going through the seven churches. The welcome... Grace and peace from Him who is and who was and is to come and from the seven spirits who are before His throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. And what you have in that welcome is a triune welcome. A welcome from the triune God. You have a welcome from the Father. He who is, he who, is, who was and he who is, is to come. Abba, our Father in heaven. And then I want you to notice the seven spirits. And who are the seven spirits talking about? Again, the number, the number of completion, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. To, to understand Revelation, there are 242 references that go back to the Old Testament. They are keys to open up the meaning of the Scripture. And if we go back, and I, again, I left this in your notes, if we go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, you see the seven ministries of the Spirit. I was teaching this a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago. Isaiah chapter, if you look here with me, 11 verses 1 and 2, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Who's that rod? Yeah, from, from Jesse came David. And from David, and then notice, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And this is a reference to Jesus. And it says, and the Spirit of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord is, again, one aspect in ministry of the Spirit. Shall rest upon Him, and the Spirit of wisdom, and the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. So when it talks about the seven spirits, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. And it's talking about his, his sevenfold ministry. We know the Holy Spirit, He produced the fruit of the Spirit in us, He gives to us spiritual gifts. 
And he has seven key ministries. Think about this. This is the spirit of wisdom and an understanding and counsel and might. We were talking about wisdom for the last four weeks. And, hey, do you need more wisdom? You know what a way to get wisdom is? To be filled by the Spirit and begin to walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. And then it says, and of Jesus Christ. So you have the Father, you have the Spirit, you have the Son. And what's beautiful about this mention here of Jesus, I want you to notice, in the Old Testament there are three key roles that are carried out by men of God. What, what are the three roles in the Old Testament? You have the prophet, you have the king, you have the, you have the priest. I, I want you to notice here in this passage because you see Jesus revealed as the prophet, priest, and king. First, he is the prophet, he is the faithful witness. And notice he, he is a faithful witness. Now, what is that? He, he is a witness of truth. He is a witness of reality. In, in Jesus, we will find the reality. We will find the reality of who we are, of what the world is, of who God is. Think, think of this where all these voices crying out, these false voices, the voice of atheism, the voice of agnosticism, the voice of pragmatism, the, the voices of, of all the different religions, all the different is, uh, isms, uh, humanism and materialism, existentialism, all those voices, He is the voice that will ultimately extinguish the pseudo-voices. His word is, is the word of truth. He is the faithful witness. You want to get your life firmly grounded in reality and become strong and firm? Then build your life upon the faithful witness, Jesus Christ, and not all the false philosophies of the world. Second thing that it says about Him, He is the priest. The firstborn from the dead. And I want you to notice verse 5. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He is the high priest who laid down his life for us at the cross of Calvary. And then he was raised from the dead. He is the, the priest who offers the most perfect sacrifice once and for all. Understand, when, when the Lord went to the cross... He fulfills the role of the high priest who would take that lamb into the tabernacle and sacrifice it and sprinkle the blood upon the atonement seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus was the high priest carrying himself, the Lamb of God, to the cross of, of Calvary, offering himself uh, for our sins. There's an a, a important note here to see him as our priest. You ever doubt the love of God? You're going through a tough time and you're doubting the love of God. You wonder, where are you, God? Why aren't you delivering me out of my problem? Why aren't you solving this problem for me, Lord God? You know, what, 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 why am I going through this? Just, you know, we sing a song here. Lead me to Calvary. It goes like this, the last stanza. I, I, tell you, I don't think I could sing it ever and not, not have tears well up in my eyes. I, I look at that so what picture of Jesus? Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me. Jesus, lead me to Calvary. When you're starting to doubt his love for you, just let the Spirit of God take you back to Calvary and see him up on that cross with those nails in his hands and his feet that were meant for you. That cross that was meant for your back. And literally an eternal eternity of hell that was placed upon him in those six hours that Friday. To set us free. Lead me to Calvary. And then I, I want you to notice him as the king. He is called the ruler over the kings of the earth. I love this passage because, you know, I look forward to the day when every knee will bow before him. Don't you look forward to the day when, when every dictator and tyrant and, and president and every person who has, who has spoken up about him in a negative way, every person who has rejected him and his lordship over their life, I look forward to the day when every ruler, when the, when the Hitlers and the Napoleons and the Herods and the Pharaohs, the Nebuchadnezzars are going to bow down before him, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, now I want you to, to just see something here with me. In verse 6. And he made us kings and priests of his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Hey, who are you? 
You know what the modern day psychologists say that our behaviors, our words, our thoughts, our actions, the way that we carry ourselves every day are all an outward reflection and all are influenced by our self-identity, by our self-concept. Who are you? I've always, I've always believed if, if you look at yourself as a failure, you're going to fail. You see yourself as a loser, you'll lose. You see yourself as a rotten, stinking sinner, and look, we have, to, we have to come to a place with a broken and contrite heart to come to Christ, but nowhere in Scripture, after a person has received the Spirit of God and been born of God, are they called that? How do you see yourself? Look at what the Lord says we are. He says we're kings. And we will rule with Him in eternity. He says that we are priests. What is a priest? A priest is a bridge builder. Between, between a holy God and sinful man, we are all called through our witness and through our prayers. You know what's a beautiful thing? I saw on Friday night a, a, a group of people who were priests ministering before the throne of God as they were worshiping. When we worship God, we are acting as priests. When we intercede and pray, we are acting as priests. When we go out and we witness, we are operating in that role as being priests. And let me just add, let me just add another one that's not mentioned here because I believe we are kings, we are priests, and we are also prophets. Now, I'm not saying we're prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Elijah, but we are all called to be really a part of that prophetic ministry. The Lord said when you have the Holy Spirit come upon you, that you are going to receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And I believe we all are in that role as being, being his, his voice, his, his word to the world. How shall they not hear? Or how can they hear without a preacher? And we were all called to go out and witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. Kings and, and priests and prophets. And he says here in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And this is a, a great passage. If you look, it talks about clouds. In Revelation chapter 19, I, I don't believe they're talking. It's talking about literal, literal puffy clouds. When the Lord comes back, he's coming back with his army, and his army is dressed in white. Myriads and myriads. And you know what I, I believe his army is? People say, oh, it's angels. No, no, I think it's angels, but I think it's, it's the church. And it's all the Old Testament saints who, are, who have now been dressed in white. And you know what? We're coming back with the Lord to kick Satan's butt. We're coming back. Think, think of the, the things he has done. The things maybe he has done to you or to your families. How he has misled you. How he lies. How he's trying to deceive you right now. The things he's done to the world. And there's the Antichrist and his army and the false prophet at Armageddon. And, and the Lord comes back and we're with the Lord. And I see the Lord, man, I'm ready. I got my sword and I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord. I'm, I'm like ready. I'm like martial arted up, ready to do battle. And here we are getting ready. I'm going to go after I want to go after the Antichrist. And the Lord, from his mouth comes a sword and he destroys. I'm like, Lord, you didn't even give me a chance. Jeez, Lord, you know, you got me all revved up. We're in the army of God. Now look, and he just, from his mouth, and he, he, he just, he destroys them. And the Antichrist, false prophet, is thrown into the lake of fire. Satan is bound for a thousand years. We'll understand more of that when we get to Revelation chapter 20. And they will look upon the one that they have pierced, which is a reference to Zechariah chapter 10, verse 14. And it speaks about the world looking upon the one they've pierced. Our, our sins have pierced him. But the Jewish people will look upon the one they have pierced and they will repent. And they're going to be a revival of Jewish people. One third of the people of Israel at that time will be saved according to Zechariah chapter 13 verses 8 and 9. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and was and is to come. And it speaks about his eternal nature. Look at verse 9 through 11. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and the kingdom, patience of Jesus Christ was on the island of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, Thyatira, to Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. I just want to just look at that and see who the author is because it's John. Somebody came up to me the other day. John came up to me the other day and said, Is John 
the John of the Gospel, the same John, yes, I believe it's the same John because he was the only John who was known by John in the church. Even John the Baptist was called the Baptist, but John was John. You know what happens in, 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 in subcultures? People are recognized by their first name. How many of you are basketball fans? And if I was to say to you, Michael, who is Michael in the NBA? Though he hasn't played around for a long time. Right? Who's LeBron? You don't have to say LeBron James, it's just LeBron. Wilt! Right? Yeah, we know, we know right away. Larry! Magic! Right? It, 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 it's just part of the subculture. When you say John, you're, you're not thinking of John the Baptist. You're thinking of John. When you say Paul, we know that it's Paul. We know it's Peter. We know it's Thomas, right? How about James? If we say James, we think of James, the brother of John, one of the Zebedee boys. Though to it, there was James and there was another James, but he, was, he wasn't that James. You know what they called him? James the Less. How would you like to go through life being known as James the Less? And then there was James, the brother of the Lord, who was the leader of the church in Acts chapter 15. Hey, in our church, it's the same way. There may be a number of Sams here, but hey, there's only one Sam, right? Right? There's, only, there's one Sue, Lenny, right? But there may be other Lens here, but there's, there's one Lenny. And sorry, Frank and Frank, and there's only one Frank. I know you're all Franks. If you stick around here long enough and serve God, you too will be remembered by that name. But there is John, and he, he is the John... He's the John who, who laid his head upon the bosom of the Lord at the Last Supper. He's the John who says, I am the one that Jesus loved. He's the John who was the only apostle who was at the cross when Jesus was being crucified. And he's the John who ran, ran Peter to get to the tomb in that morning. It's, it's that John who was there on the island of Patmos, and this is neat, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. They put him there because he was preaching the gospel. Domitian, the emperor of Rome, one of the cruelest emperors. He was killing Christians left and right. He was exiling Christians. He exiled John to the island of Patmos, this small little island in the Aegean Sea, part of the Mediterranean Sea, off the coast of Asia Minor, between Asia Minor and Greece. And he says this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What makes for a mature Christian? I see a lot of flaky Christians wherever I go. A lot of people call themselves Christians. You know what? The only time they're really Christian is when they're on the mountaintop. When things are good, I'm going to be Christian. That's, that's when I can worship God. That, that's when I can praise the Lord. That's when I can witness. That's when I can walk with... Or you get the Christians, the only time they, they come around is when bad things are happening to them. That's when they need God. You know what's neat about John? John is in the Spirit and he's in prison. He's in prison. He's in shackles. They, they say that John was chained from his neck to his calves where he could, not, he could not stand up until his spine fused together and later when he was released after Domitian's em, 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 empire came to an end that John would be carried in to the church of Ephesus on a big board and John would sit there. Imagine being taught by John, 90-year-old, 80-year-old John, again, the one who walked with the Lord, the one who heard the heartbeat of God, and being taught by him. But here is John, and John is again, he's a picture of, of mature. You know, John grew up really fast. You don't need to be old to be mature. I matured very quickly in my faith. But it, it, you can mature very quickly if you'll walk in the Spirit. You know, John, at the beginning of his ministry with Jesus, they're walking through Samaria, and John and James said, Lord, look at these people, they're rebelling against you. Let's call down fire from heaven and disintegrate them all. Kind of immature. And then he gets his mother to come to Jesus and say, let my son sit on your throne. And Jesus said, hey, that's, that's not for me to do. The ones who are going to sit and reign with me, they're the ones who are going to measure up. But then John matured. And John really grasps onto the love of God. And John is the one again who says, I'm the one he loved. Seven times, seven times in the book of John. And he's the one who puts his head upon the Lord's heart. And he's there at the cross, caring for Mary. And the Lord says, Woman, behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother. And John now takes her in. Why did John take Mary in at that time? Because Jesus' other brothers and sisters were not believers. So he takes, he takes in Mary. And he's the one who, who was there at the resurrection. He ran down and he was the first one to get in there and see the empty tomb. He outran Peter. He matured quick, and you see his maturity. He, he's not in the spirit 
right? Only when things are good. He's not in the spirit only when things are bad. It didn't matter whether it was good or bad or if he's on the mountaintop or down in the valley. Whether it was raining or sunny, he was in the spirit. That's maturity. That's what it is to to grow up to be a mature man or woman of God. And then it, it tells us that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, Sunday. If you, look, if you just look for a moment, verse 19, the word of God here, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things that will take place after this. Boy, does God make the book of the Revelation easy. There's the outline of the book. The, thing, the things which, uh, which you have seen, Revelation 1, the things which are, Revelation 2 and 3, and the things that are to come is Revelation 4 through 22. That is an outline as, as clear as can be as you go through this book. And again, we'll be looking at that in upcoming weeks. And then I, I want you to notice the final vision. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about his chest with a golden band, and his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like fine brass as refined in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his, in his right hand seven stars out of His mouth went the sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead but he laid his right hand on me saying to me do not be afraid I am the first and the last I am uh, he who lives and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of of Hades and of death. And if, if you just look real quick at verse 20 you see part of the interpretation and the greatest interpreter of scripture of course is scripture and It tells us in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are are the seven churches. And there's a beautiful picture here that there is the Lord standing in the midst of the church. The Lord Jesus is here today in the midst of his church. As far as I, I have seen in my walk with him, he's always been in the midst of his church. One like the Son of Man, which he is described in in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as, and it comes from Daniel chapter 7, 13. Although he's glorified here, he still has the appearance of, 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 there's a a human appearance here. And and he was clothed with a garment down to his feet. That's the the garment of the high priest, because he is our high priest, who died once and for all to take away our sins. And on his chest was a golden band, which is a a girdle. It's, It's a picture of authority. And we've been studying, uh, studying on Wednesday night the authority of the Lord. You got some problems? Jesus has the authority over sickness. You got some issues? Jesus has the authority over the angelic realm and demons. Jesus has the authority over the weather and the storms. And we're going to look this coming Wednesday night. Jesus has the authority to forgive all your sins and pardon you of all your inequities. That's what that sash is a resemblance of. It was a picture of authority. And his hair was white like wool, which speaks of his eternalness. He is the Ancient of Days. And his eyes are aflame with fire. When my kids are growing up, and I still do it from time to time, you know when they're acting up a little bit? Most of the time my wife had to yell at them. All I needed to do was go like this. crazy eyes. You know what they'd say to me when I do that? They'd say, what? My, my son, he does it all the time. My son's, at, my son's acting up. Like, he goes to me, what? 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 Just, just one, one look, that, 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 that look of indignation. And you know what Jesus is indignant about? He's indignant about an evil world. And he's indignant about an apostate church. We'll look at that next week. Feet like fine brass refined in the furnace, which is a a symbol of the brazen altar in the tabernacle that had feet of brass. It was the place where sin was judged and is a place of refinement. And his voice was the sound of many waters. I like this. You ever ever been at at a waterfall or you get to Niagara Falls and the, the water is so deafening? You know what's beautiful here? His voice, his voice is going to drown out all those religious voices, all the, those, those, pseudo, those pseudo voices, all the false prophets, all the false teachers, all the isms, everything that's false will be drowned out by the voice of Jesus Christ. 
And he held the seven stars in his right hand and talks about the seven messengers or angelos, angels of the church. Some people say they're angels. I actually uh, think they are angels. Some people say they're pastors and I actually believe that, that each church has an angel. And out of his mouth came a, two, a sharp two-edged sword. And what's interesting about the, the sword that comes from the Lord's mouth the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through bone and marrow, coming to the very soul of a man. The heart that's right, God's word can penetrate into our lives and it can cut away the sickness and the disease. It can cut away the sin and the ugliness. But the heart that's not right, it's a heart of judgment. Like we look at again in Revelation chapter 19. The people who have rejected his word, let me tell you something, that word will cut them to pieces. That word, that word will ultimately destroy them, that, that, that sword that flows from his mouth. And his countenance, like the sun shining in its strength, which, which talks about his, his glory, like the Mount of Transfiguration when he was glorified. He's so bright that you can't even look at it. And, and in light of all of this, and I want you to see this with John, in light of all of this, here's this vision. Folks, have you had a vision of Jesus lately? You know, the, the, the Word of God is useless if you don't experience the Word of God through it. You know, wait, to study the Word of God and not to experience the Word of God, Jesus, is to become a scribe. You know, there's lots of scribes in the church. They, they just study the Word for the sake of the Word. But they're not meeting the Son of God in the Word. To study the, uh, the Word of God and not to obey it is to be like the Pharisees, hypocrites. And to not believe in the Word of God is to be like the Sadducees, the, the liberals of the time. But we're not called to be Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees. You know what we're called to be? We're called to be prophets. To have a heart for God. And to come to the Word and, and, to, and to find Jesus. You know, I was in the Word this morning and I was in the Spirit this morning on the Lord's Day. I was in the Spirit this morning for a few hours on the Lord's Day. And, and there was just one point where, you know, it was just God is drawing me closer and closer and closer. And then all of a sudden comes the breakthrough. And as I'm sitting there, I'm just taken away in the Spirit. And I'm sitting there and just like, I, I could just describe it to you. It's like waves. When, I, when I've laid on the beach and, and the, these, these waves are just flowing over my body. The waves are flowing over my soul. Waves of God's love, waves of God's holiness. And I'm just like, uh, my hair is standing up on end and I'm tingling all over the place. And I'm experiencing God. And, and there is Jesus just revealing himself to me in all of his glory and love. That, that's the experience that should be coming to us when we come with the right heart in the word of God. John experienced the Lord. And John, the one who laid his head upon the heart of the Lord and heard the heartbeat of God, he is filled with awe. He, remember we talked about awe last week, the fear of God and reverence. Look at John. John falls down on his face like a dead man. The same John. John who laid his head upon the heart of the Lord. And John is, is, is totally flawed here. What's neat here? There ain't nothing cavalier about what John is experiencing here. This isn't, this isn't some religious clown going through the motions, folks. This is a man of God who is seeking God and he gets flawed by God. He's filled with awe. He's filled with wonder. He's filled with the fear of the Lord. It's one who was so familiar with the Lord gets blown away by the Lord. Don't get too familiar with God. And don't get too familiar with His Son. When you think you got Him figured out, He'll blow you away. You ever seen a little lion cub playing with Daddy Lion? Right, he just sits there and the club is just pawing at him, scratching at him, and then all of a sudden, Dad gets a little bit annoyed. And he roars. You ever see what happens to the little cub? Little cub just freezes. That's what's happening here. It wasn't that John was annoying, uh, annoying Jesus. Jesus, Jesus just, he just let out the roar, the Lion of Judah. And, and John is, is flawed. And then look at the beauty. Jesus reaches out his right hand. Hey, dads, you know when your kids are hurting? You go over to them. Maybe they've had a rough day at school. Maybe they've gone through some difficulties in sports. You know, you, you, know, you put out that right hand? Strength. And you get just that right hand. If you're left-handed, maybe use your left hand. But it's that, it's that hand of, 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 you know, of comfort. And he says this to him. He says, do not be afraid. And he gives reason. For I am the first and the last, because he's the eternal one and he is in control. And he knows our tomorrows. 
He, he knows what's going to happen to us tomorrow. By the way, Sandy and Felix, the Lord knew that that woman would be drunk and would crash into your car on Friday night. And, and Sarah, you know, Sarah and Carlos, the Lord knew beforehand that somebody would break into your, your mom's house and he, she would rob the house. And the Lord knows what's going to happen to us tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. He doesn't freak out like we do. Oh, don't believe what happened! The, the Father doesn't say to Jesus, Oh, Jesus, look what happened to Frank today! Holy Spirit, look what's going on there. He knows our tomorrows. He says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And it talks about his sacrificial death and his victory as the risen Savior who is alive forever and ever. He's alive forever and ever. My, my, sa my Savior is going to be alive tomorrow to save me, and he's going to be alive on the day that I die. And he's going to be alive 10,000 years from now. And I got saved on January 15th in 1983, knelt down on my bathroom floor and I prayed the sinner's prayer and the Lord came into my heart and I'm saved today. And I've been saved every day since. He's kept me saved. And, and I'll be saved until the day I die. And on the day I die, I'm going to be saved. And 10,000 years from now, I'm going to be saved. And 10 trillion, zillion, billion, zillion years from now, I'm going to be saved because He is my Savior. And behold, He is alive forever and ever. And He has the keys of Hades and death when Adam and Eve sinned, those keys were given to the devil. When the Lord was raised from the dead, he went back and he said to Satan, give me my keys back. And he took them back. In the book of Hebrews chapter 2.14, you get a little glimpse of this, that through his death he might destroy him who had the power of death, which is the devil, to free us. And he holds the keys of Hades and death. Amen. Folks, let me just, just wrap this up and I want to share just a couple of uh, closing thoughts with you. Just you, you look at this and again, John the Beloved. John, the, 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 the one who was just so close and intimate with Jesus, but you see the revelation of God come to him. And, and again, he, he is just flawed by, by the law, Lord. He is filled with wonder and reverence. This, this is a, a life and this is an experience that God wants us to, to, to live in and walk with. To, to be experiencing Jesus in our lives every day as we come to Him with a broken and contrite heart in humility and in faith as we are, we are led by the Spirit of God that we would experience Him. You want know, to just say something to you? You have to forgive me as your pastor at times. I get carried away at times trying to think that I can somehow motivate people to be better witnesses or worshipers or disciples. I can't. The, the, the person who, who has not experienced Christ and, and the person who is not walking in the Spirit, you know, Jesus, Jesus really said it sarcastically. He, was, he didn't use sarcasm, but he says if you, you put a ring in a pig's snout, what do you have? You still got a pig. And the point he was making, and it sounds real cruel, but the point he was making is change has to occur within like you, you can't just keep trying to lay laws and rules and, and you know, outward motivation to get people to live for Christ. It, it's the experience of Christ that comes to us through His Spirit. Then it's not just a one-time thing, it's an ongoing thing. This is a process, this is a relationship, this is a journey. And when you have that experience, and it's, it's an ongoing experience, that, that's, that's what brings the power to witness and to be His disciple and obey Him and do the things He's called you to do and and work, work, work the miracles he's called you to work. And John gives us a, a beautiful picture of that. What a life he led. And even as an old man, it wasn't over because the Lord came and visited on Patmos and gave him again that revelation. When was the last time you had a revelation of the Lord like that? That brought you down on your face before him? And when, when was the last time God flawed you and he awed you? And you, you, you were just blown away. I think that's what, what God wants for us. Would you bow your heads? We'll close in prayer.